Uh, The reading for today is taken from John chapter 5, and we'll be following from verses 1 to 18. Uh, If you'd like to, you can follow along in your Bibles and your pews. That's John chapter 5, verses 1 to 18. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who has made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, at this point in the service, we have what we call talk one, don't we? And we actually got a very, very, very special guest joining us today. Now we have to give him a bit of a drum roll and then he'll just appear magically. So with your knees and your hands, let's give our special guest a drum roll. Hi, and welcome to That's Right, You're Wrong. My name is Sydney Harbour Bridge. That's double barrel, by the way. And I am from the land where everything is upside down. That's right, I'm from Australia. And uh, I am our quiz host for this morning. And in today's quiz, you have to get everything wrong. And if you get it wrong, then you're right. And every time our contestant gets an answer wrong, I want you to shout, that's right, you're wrong. Can we try that? Three, two, one. That's right, you're wrong. Thank you, there's some wonderful Australian accents in there as well. I'm very, very, very impressed indeed. Right, now the prize for today is a special Australian Toblerone. As you can see, it comes upside down. So, can I have a volunteer to be a contestant to compete for the upside down Toblerone? Uh, Young man over there, why don't you come up? Now, Charlie, do we have a microphone for our young contestant here? Yes, we do. Right, now, do you understand the rules of the game? Yes. Now, I hope you mean no, because the correct answer to every question is the wrong answer to every question. Okay, we'll let you have that one as a freebie, though. Oh, goodness, with my take me seriously glasses on, I can barely read this, but okay, here we go. Question number one. What city are we currently in? Manchester. That's right, you're wrong. That is one out of one. Well done. Okay, it's going well. Okay, what day is it today? Wednesday. That's right! You're wrong! Good, okay, who's taller, me or Charlie? (laughs) You. That's right! You're wrong! What's two plus two? Eighteen. That's right! You're wrong! What is the Queen's name? Wendy. (laughs) <laughs> That's right! You're wrong! It's going well so far. You've got 0 out of 5, which is 5 out of 5. Okay, right, next question. What kind of animal was the Tyrannosaurus Rex? A cheetah. A cheetah. That's right! You're wrong! 
what weather, I've never seen one of these, uh, what weather would you use that for? Heat waves. A heat wave. Mm. That's right. You're wrong. Yeah, I've got confirmation. That's right. You're wrong. Okay. Uh, where does the Prime Minister live? In Harborne. In Harborne. That's right. You're wrong. How many loose teeth have been reported in church family news this year? Zero. That's right. You're wrong. And last of all, now this is a tough one. What's your name, mate? Bob. That's right. You're wrong. Congratulations. You are now the proud owner of uh, an Australian table. And make sure you keep it the right way up, which is the wrong way up. Okay? Let's give our contestant Bob a round of applause, shall we? Fabulous. Well, I don't know where he came from, but anyway. <laughs> um, in our reading this morning in John 5, we see the next of our signs where Jesus reveals who he is. You might remember that we've been uh, remembering what John says at the end of his gospel, that Jesus did lots and lots of things, so many things, they couldn't, they couldn't possibly all be recorded. But, but John says, I've recorded these so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And what's strange about this sign that John gives us is that it clearly points to that. At the very last verse that we heard has the religious authorities trying all the harder to kill Jesus because what he's done and what he's saying about himself points to him being God's son. So there's something about the reactions to Jesus in John 5 that is a bit like a game of that's right, you're wrong where people see clearly and yet jump to entirely the wrong conclusion, or at least respond in exactly the wrong way. Now, I think that's what you're going to be looking at, at kids in Sunday school, as you go through uh, just now, and uh, that's what we'll be thinking about as we look at John 5 together, how it can be that we can get the signs upside down, that our response to Jesus can be all wrong, even when we've got everything we need, uh, in front of us. So we're going to, those of us who are staying in here, are going to sing our next song, which is 10,000 Reasons, uh, and Charlie's going to uh, lead the kids out uh, for Sunday school. So uh, please, as the music starts, will you stand together to sing? I confess to being quite a fan of the comedian Steve Martin. Um, now, his stuff, as with many people like him and, and Mel Brooks, who have a kind of streak of comic genius, his stuff is a bit hit and miss, but when it hits, it really hits. Uh, and there's a film called uh, The Man With Two Brains, which kind of showcases both sides of Steve Martin, I think, in one sense. Uh, but there's an incredible scene in it. He's uh, a widower, and he's thinking uh, of remarrying a highly unsuitable woman. Uh, and he stands in front of, in, in his huge house, he stands in front of a, a giant portrait of his deceased wife. Uh, and he says to her uh, what he's planning to do, and says, if, if you're not happy, if that's not right, just give me a sign, and I won't do it. And the next moment, there is a crashing thunder outside the window. There is lightning everywhere. The picture spins around on the wall uh, as if it's going to fly off. And the word no is heard screamed from the ether. And he just stands there, impassive, and eventually everything returns to normal. The picture sort of rocks to a standstill. And completely deadpan, he says, look, just anything, any sign. And I think that's a bit what's going on here in John chapter 5. Just if you've got it open in front of you, look at it with me. There's a, a, a festival going on in Jerusalem that explains why Jesus is there. It also explains why it's crowded. But there are people who are always there. 
in this one particular place, near the Sheep Gate, by this colonnaded pool. The sick, the paralyzed, lying there hoping for a miracle. Hoping that with the disturbance of the waters, the first one in will be cured, will be healed. And Jesus comes up and surveys this kind of crowd of need. And he makes diligent inquiries, at least that's how it seems. He, he finds out about the people, he finds out about this one man. He's been there for 38 years. 38 years lying helpless, hoping for deliverance, hoping for restoration and healing. 38 years. And in a moment, everything changes. Jesus says to him, do you want to get well? And the man says, desperately. I, I, I've been waiting here. I have no one to help me into the water. I, 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 I'm helpless. And Jesus just says to him, take up your mat and walk. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. It's as simple as that. He speaks to him with this kind of incredible authority that just changes everything for him. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And the man, well, his body obeys. He is completely healed. The mat would have been the sort of burden that a, that a sort of strong, healthy person could carry, and now suddenly he's strong and healthy, and he's carrying it through Jerusalem. There is something astonishing that has just happened. And this man who's been lying there for 38 years, his identity wouldn't have been a secret, would it, from the people who saw him? They'd have known exactly who he was. He was a fixture. The religious leaders had probably grown up walking past him, seeing him there waiting to be healed. And yet when they see him carrying his mat, their response is frankly astonishing. They're interested in the fact that he's carrying his mat. They're not interested in the fact that he is carrying his mat. Do, do you see what I mean? There is an undeniable miracle that has just taken place. And they're concerned about a Sabbath regulation about what they would consider to be a breach of the Sabbath command. Now, when the Sabbath command is given in the book of Exodus, it's, it's pretty clear that what's intended is your, your normal sort of daily work, that you're to spend that for a day in order to rest and to worship. Now, whatever else you might say about this man, his occupation has not been mat carrying. The mat's been carrying him, not the other way around. But there were these sort of 39 regulations that uh, the religious leaders had sort of gradually put in place in order to, to sort of hedge around the law to make sure that no one accidentally broke the Sabbath by doing something that was too much like work. And they see him carrying his mat and they say, well, that's one of the 39. How dare you? And the man says, the man who made me well told me to carry it. And then we begin to see how his response may not quite be right either. Because they say to him, well, who was it? And John says, chapter 5, verse 13, the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd and was there. Contrast the two main characters in this drama. Jesus, who's so interested in this man that he's found out all about him, that he's spoken to him. He doesn't just heal him. He gets to know about him. He, takes, he finds out his history. He finds out all about his life. He asks him if he wants to be well and then heals him. He's deeply personally interested. And this man, who is given his life back in a moment, it seems is not at all inquisitive about who Jesus is. I don't know who it is. I've got not a, not a clue. It's quite striking, isn't it? When John tells us that the purpose of Jesus' signs is to point to his identity, 
Here is someone on the receiving end of one of those incredible signs. He's not interested in Jesus' identity at all. And then later on, Jesus bumps into him again, there in the temple, and says to him, stop sinning. Something worse could happen to you. And rather than thinking, this is the man whose voice had the authority to make me whole, he thinks, oh, now I know who you are. I can go and tell the authorities. What he's interested in is the approval of the ones who are seeking Jesus' destruction. So that even in that moment, actually, he's not interested in what knowing Jesus could mean for him. He's not interested in following Jesus. He's interested in getting on the right side of the people who hate Jesus. It's quite something, isn't it? When you see it in those terms, it is so stark. Uh, and then John sort of ratchets it up by pointing to the, re to the response of the Jewish leaders who begin to persecute Jesus because he'd done this thing on the Sabbath. Now, there's something about the way the sign happens that points to Jesus' identity. He doesn't do, as we saw last week with Jesus healing someone who was miles away, he doesn't do the things that faith healers do. He doesn't run his hands over the patient. He doesn't chant an incantation. He doesn't offer prayers. He doesn't offer sacrifices. He simply commands, get up. There's no healing like that recorded in the Old Testament. Uh, the, where, where there are miraculous healings, they're performed by prophets who prostrate themselves in prayer. But here is one whose voice has authority that is like the authority of God. This is how the Bible begins. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And here Jesus says, get up, take your mat, and walk. And the man gets up, takes his mat, and walks. There's a deliberate parallel to the way in which Jesus' voice carries that kind of authority. The same kind of authority as the God who made the universe. But rather than wondering, who is this? They think they know. So they persecute him, and Jesus says to them in his defense, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. You see, Jesus wants this sign to point to his identity as the son of God. And it's actually a very sort of striking and, and intricate defense, the way it's then worked out through the rest of John chapter 5, uh, where Jesus shows that it's his sonship that's in view, that he is actually a son acting in obedience to his father in all that he does. We'll come back to the impact of that in a second. But Jesus confronts them with the meaning of the sign. And their response is not to consider it even for a second. But they do understand it. So for this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. There's no lack of evidence here, and there is no lack of understanding here. It's not that they've misunderstood Jesus, and it's not that they don't have good grounds for, th for thinking that maybe what he's saying is true. There's evidence, and there is understanding but what goes with it is rejection. I think one of the terrifying things that we see sometimes in the Gospels is that people don't reject Jesus because they don't have any inkling who he might be, but because they do. Jesus tells a, a parable of a vineyard, uh, and uh, the owner lives a long way away. And um, the tenants of the vineyard stop paying their rent. 
Uh, and so Jesus, as the owner, sent messengers, sent servants to the tenants of the vineyard uh, and uh, invited them to pay. And Jesus says, some they mistreated, others they killed. He's talking about the Old Testament prophets sent to the people to call them back to faithfulness to God. Uh, and he says, time and again, you rejected them. You turned them away. Some of them you even killed. But then Jesus goes on in the parable to say, in the end, the owner of the vineyard decided to send his son, thinking, this is my son. Surely they will respect him. He said, the tenants of the vineyard, seeing that it was the son, said to themselves, look, it's the son. If we kill him, the vineyard can be ours alone. If we murder the rightful heir, we can have the vineyard to ourselves. And as Jesus tells that parable, The religious leaders hear and understand it. They know he's told it against them. And so what is their reaction? Once more, they plot to kill him. What's going on in these kinds of situations? What is John trying to draw our attention to? Well, remember what he says. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing may have life in his name. It's not enough to observe. It's not enough to receive the evidence. Actually, it's not enough to receive blessing from Jesus. That's what John wants us to understand. Here is a man who's been healed. He's had his life given back to him by Jesus. Jesus has made all the difference in the world to him. And yet somehow... stands in opposition in the end to Jesus. It's hugely sobering, isn't it? You can know all about him. You can have great insight in some ways into who he is. You can receive great blessing from him. But none of that gives you eternal life. None of that gives you what Jesus wants you to have. It is only putting your faith in him, trusting in him as the son of God, throwing yourself on him and before him in worship. That is the only response that brings the blessing that Jesus came to give. That's what it means to believe. So as Jesus goes on to explain uh, what his relationship to his father is like, let me just read you, read you what he says. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so even the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Jesus says, I am the one who just like God the Father gives life to the dead. I'm the one who's been appointed judge over everyone. And the way that you show, the way that you experience and express a, a relationship with God, a living, life-giving relationship with God in worshiping him that means worshipping me too. That's what he means when he says, whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. What an extraordinary sentence to pass on those leaders who are rejecting Jesus. He says, you're not honouring the Father. You think you're defending the Father's honour? In fact, you are robbing him of his honour. Because the Father has so given the Son to have life and authority and judgment that to honour the Father is to honour the Son. And to fail to honour the Son is to fail to honour the Father. 
So John's message with this sign is a searching one. How do you respond to Jesus? Do you honor him? Do you actually treat him as God in your life? That's what Jesus says we are to do. To treat him as if he really is God, because that's who he is. Eternally the son of the father. Who has authority over my life. Who is the one who can give me new life. Who is the one who one day will be my judge. What's my relationship to him like? And it strips away all the things that we so easily can replace that with. Our years of service in the church, our years of attendance, our, our, our deep understanding and knowledge of the scriptures, amazing things that may have happened in our lives, miracles even, none of those are enough. One thing and one thing only is enough. And that is to put your faith in the Son. To put your trust in Jesus. To honour him. And so to honour his Father. I find that very searching. I can so easily look at things that have happened in my life and treat those as they they give me confidence. But it is only my relationship to him that matters in the end. So what I'd like to invite us to do is to take a moment of quiet just to reflect on that and to ask today, am I trusting in Jesus or am I trusting in something else? In my history, in my service, in my experiences, And I'll lead us in a prayer. And then in a moment, Jen will come and lead us in our family prayers. Gracious Father, we thank you for these signs that John's, John records for us that point to the identity of Jesus that shows so clearly that he is your son, but not only your son, but your Messiah, your chosen one, come into this world to bring life to those who would otherwise be dead. And Father, we pray that you will, by your Holy Spirit, give us grace today to respond rightly to Jesus. Help us not to try to Force him to fit into our categories that give us control. But help us to trust him as he truly is God. Give us that grace, we pray. Keep our trust in him. Give us life through him. In Jesus' name, amen.